Today in the Lazy D&D Talk Show, we're going to talk about the new playtest that just came out. This is the Cleric and Revised Species playtest that, that just came out from Wizards of the Coast. We're going to talk about Jeremy Crawford and what he said about backward compatibility and also what we can find out about backward compatibility from the most recent playtest. I'm going to do a spotlight of Kobold Press's Tome of Beast 3. And we're going to look at Kobold Press's adventure calendar. They're doing sort of an adventure calendar you can pick up either for free or for heavily discounted products at Kobold Press. And we're going to go with the first batch of questions from the Sly Flourish Patreon Q&A for December of 2022. I'm your pal, Mike Shea from Sly Flourish, here to talk to you about all things D&D. This show is brought to you by the patrons of Sly Flourish. Patrons get access to all kinds of exclusive DM tips, adventures, city source books, dedicated Discord channels, and the monthly Q&A. But most of all, patrons help me be put on shows like this to the patrons of Sly Flourish. Thank you so much for your support. Yeah, every so often, things are really quiet in the world of D&D. And like when I'm thinking about what I'm going to talk about on the show, I'm like, I don't know, it's not a lot. I guess I'll do some previews. I'll do some other things, talk about some other stuff. And then there's like giant explosions of things. And this last week, there was giant explosions of things. The big one is a new play test coming out for one D&D, the new, the new version of D&D that's coming out in 2024. This is the third play test. And this one was a smaller play test, but had some pretty big changes. The first one was talking about the cleric, but the, the big one is that Wizards of the Coast is switching from the term race to the term species. I think this is a good change. I'm I'm happy with the change. I'm not too wedded to or bound to the the term species. There's lots of conversation in lots of different places of should it be ancestry, should it be origin, should it be you know, all different kinds of things that that you know different terms that could replace species. What I found interesting in Wizards of the Coast description is they said first of all we are definitely stepping away from race. We are we have checked with multiple cultural consultants about the term species and that's the one that they agreed to the most. So I, I have a feeling species is probably it. And it's it's not I'm I'm not heavily wedded to any of it. I don't have a strong opinion a, a strong opinion of it. So if it ends up species I'm fine. If it's something else like origin or ancestry I'm fine with those two. There are other people who are far more wedded to what we're going to call this thing than I am, and it'll it'll work its way out. So this is one where I'm like, I'll sit in my raft on the lazy river and see where things go. But I think it is a good change. I think that we have seen it with many other current RPGs have broken away from the idea of race and gone to other gone to other terms. I believe Level Up 5e did this already. I know that Pathfinder 2 did this. Lots of other big RPGs have gone in this direction. So it's an obvi- it's a it's a good direction to go. There's a big question that Wizards was going to do it because they're talking about 50 years of legacy here and we're talking you know a lot that term has been used for a long time it's a it's a it's a big change but it's a good one and i'm glad to see them do it let's take a look at some of the other things they did in the play test i'm probably going to talk about this play test more than one show this probably isn't the only time i'm going to talk about it but i thought we'd give it a quick scheme i i read it through i saw things that i looked at and i i didn't see anything i'm like oh that's so terrible oh god this is the worst thing that's ever happened i'm definitely i'm definitely in fact the statement i'll make seeing this play test and seeing what Jeremy Crawford said in his video talking about the survey from the last play test, I have definitely swung towards a more optimistic view of where things going. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. I still go with the, did we need it? And I don't, I don't know we did. And the example of did we need it is the 2014 Player's Handbook was like the number 17 best-selling book on Amazon last week. Now, granted, it was a $17 player's handbook. So it was a dirt, it was being sold for dirt cheap. But the fact that it was like the number 17 best selling book two weeks ago makes me question do we really need another version of DD? And I would still hang on to that. I'm not seeing changes that I feel like are so profound that it's worth the shift. Because no matter what you do, no matter how good it is, there's going to be a split. There's going to be people who liked it the old way. There's going to be people who liked it the new way. There's going to be people who got confused. I was talking to a neighbor of mine who's playing, his son is playing D&D, relatively new to D&D. And he's like, there's a new version coming out. It's like, is that going to be a problem? I just bought the monster manual for him. He's already feeling apprehensive about a book he just bought, even though it's two years away, because it's like, how often? And he asked like, well, how long does it take for people to switch to a new version once that version comes out? And I was like, for some, never. Like there are people that are playing first edition D&D now, second edition, third edition. They're all very popular. I don't know if they're very popular, but they're being played by lots of people. So you don't really ever have to change. I said, it doesn't really matter what anybody else is doing. It only matters what you and your group want to do. So if you're good with the stuff that you've got, you don't have to change. But there was still this apprehension and confusion. Is it worth that? 
for the stuff we're seeing. I'm not sure. That's a different, that's a, that's kind of a different conversation, but am I seeing specific things that make me go, Oh God, Oh, what was me? No, I'm not. And in fact, I'm seeing some things where I'm like, Oh, this is actually makes me feel more optimistic about, about what's going on in this. They focused on clerics. They, they, they picked on clerics specifically. I don't know why it doesn't, I guess it doesn't matter. And they talk about how to play it. They talk about what you can do. They talk about the fact that you can run through like journey through the Radiant Citadel or Canopy Mysteries if you want to run one shot games. They mention the fact that pretty much everything that isn't in this, you're expected to be pulling out of the 2014 Player's Handbook. Again, that gets to that idea of compatibility. The playtest is compatible enough with the old stuff that you use the old stuff for everything that isn't in it. They talk about what's what's ahead. Lots of interesting things. For, 48 subclasses. That's more than the Player's Handbook has. New, new and revised spells, new and revised feats, new weapon options. I know, so Crawford talked a lot about this. This is going to be pretty interesting. And there's lots of questions. I see it on Reddit a lot of times. There's a lot of angst about melees versus spellcasters. So this weapon option idea might be a way that you can expand it. Again, did we need it to be in a new edition or could you just stick that in a Tasha-like book? I think I'd go with the Tasha-like book. New system for creating home base for your characters. Revised encounter building rules. Very interested in that. And new and revised monsters. Very interested in that. Those are those are both things. Th- that, that latter half, I'm really interested to hear about that. And I think when we talk about compatibility, that's where compatibility is really going to be a big question. How much are they going to change monster design? Are they going to change it heavily from what Monsters of the Multiverse was? If it's Monsters of the Multiverse... We're good. And we'll talk about that in Tome of Beasts. Now, new primary ability. So one of the big things that changes in here is this is the first class. Is, is it the first class? I don't know if it's the first class that did this way, but it's one of the first classes that we've seen in the playtest where you don't get your subclass option until third level. F- Clerics were one of the ones that got it at first level. Crawford talks about this in his videos. And what he brings up when he talks about it is that like making a character pick a subclass in the same breath that they're picking a class, a background, an origin, or sorry, species. I'm going to get that. It's going to take me a while to get used to the new vocabulary. That's a lot of things to be picking at first level. And the idea of moving it to third level normalizes subclasses, but it also makes the decision paralysis a little bit better. It means that it's easier for new players to pick up characters like a cleric without having to worry about picking up subclass right away and learning all the mechanics of the subclass. And that's fine. What I what I find particularly interesting about this and what makes me happy, this might have been in the old one too. In fact, what let's do a little let's do a little investigation. Let's do like let's take a look here and see. Was was this statement in the previous one? So this is the previous play test for expert classes, rogues and stuff like that. And yes, so it's it has the same thing. So I blew a gasket on this show episodes back episodes ago mostly saying like is it really worth moving subclasses to third level and thus breaking compatibility with all previous subclasses and but there's a statement in here and the statement is in this one and the statement's also in the cleric one as well that says a class's description is followed by a section dedicated to subclasses a subclass represents an area of specialization blah 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 when playtesting the new version of a class you can use a subclass from an older source such as the 2014 player's handbook or Tasha's cauldron of everything if the older source of subclass offers features at levels that are different from the subclass levels in the class follow the older subclass level progression after the class lets you gain the subclass so in other words if you find cleric subclasses in Tasha's and you want to use them with the cleric class from the playtest, the first feature they get from Tasha's, they get at third level. But ever after that, all of the other ones you get at whatever level they originally came out at. That is about as compatible as you can get and change subclasses. But what I like about it is that Wizards is saying the intention is for you to be able to use their older stuff. What I like about this is it's not just Tasha's. It's a million other books that have come out from a million, maybe thousands, thousands of other books that have come out that include subclass options from third party publishers that would have been broken if they didn't let that happen. Now, there's one little difference I'm noticing between this one and the newer one. This is the cleric one, which says this paragraph is new. In some cases, you might find an older subclass doesn't fully work with the features in the playtest version of a class. If we publish the, a new version of the class, we'll resolve that discrepancy. Is the term class here a typo? Do they mean a new version of the subclass? I'm not sure. If we take it by what it says, it means that they're going to keep iterating on the class to make sure it works with older subclasses. Maybe. 
it wouldn't surprise me if they meant subclass. And what they're saying is we're going to revise a subclass. If the subclass doesn't work with the new class, we're going to do a revision of that subclass. I don't know. Maybe I'm reading into that too much. Maybe I should just read it at what it says. And what it says is new version of the class, i.e. they're going to keep iterating on the class to make sure it doesn't have features that are incompatible, incompatible with previous subclasses. But that's really hard to do because there's a whole lot of subclasses. So I'm not really sure. This part of it matters to me because it's not an issue of like, oh, they changed Banish, which is great. New Banish is cool. To me, it's a matter of I'm surrounded by books. I back tons of Kickstarters. I have probably more than a thousand PDFs of different things that have come out, many of which have options that I would like to continue to be able to use. And I don't want to see all of that stuff break. I don't think it's worth, I don't think anything that we've seen in 1D&D is good enough that it warrants breaking compatibility to all this myriad of material that that I own or that we all own. But I'm, I'm happy to see that. I'm also particularly happy to see that Crawford brings this up again in a video that he did on the 1D&D survey results for the previous play test. He said, I heard this and I was like, oh, and I had to listen to it again this morning. And then right before the show, I listened to it and wrote it down in a quote because I, I'm going to keep this quote because I'm going to hold him to it. And the quote was, this is a great time for me to clarify that whatever new version we present in the 2024 player's handbook can stand alongside options like those that appear in Fizban's Treasury of Dragons. Now he was talking specifically about the new dragonborn species it's going to take a while. It's going to take a while. He, when he's talking about the new Dragonborn species, he's saying the Dragonborn species options that exist in, that will exist in the 2024 Player's Handbook will stand alongside the origins for Dragonborn that exists in Fizzbands. Sure, he just brought up Fizzbands, but he's just talking about that topic. But then we saw the same quote from the playtest document. And the, play, the, the quote from the playtest document said that it could be compatible like Tasha's, which means older stuff is going to be compatible. Maybe, probably, likely. I would say likely. I would say they're at least aiming that way. And I would think it's going to be a big shift if they say, oh, you know what? We changed our minds. We are going to break compatibility, especially after doing three play tests, because this is expensive. They are spending a lot of time and a lot of money building these play tests, putting them out, reading the survey results, iterating on it and coming up with new designs. I don't think we're going to be seeing, I would not expect that we're going to see huge, significant changes from the kinds of things we've already seen in the current play tests. Now I've had friends, I've talked with some other designer friends. We have lots of conversations about this all the time. Every week I'm talking with designers all week about these kinds of things and what it means and what we read into it. And there are some who bring up the D&D Next play test from 10 years ago. I was around during the, I was around, I'm not 10 years old. I was playing D&D and I played heavily in the D&D Next play test. I ran it for my group. We, we learned a lot from it. So some were saying, yes, but if you look back at the D&D Next play test, things changed radically in that play test. And it did. The first iterations of the play test of D&D Next were significantly different from what came out in the sense that like skills weren't in it. There weren't skills. As an example, everything was an opposed check. If you cast a spell, there wasn't a saving throw, DC. You did opposed ability checks to see who won. There was all kinds of stuff that was very different from what came out in the in the, in the the end. And so my, my designer friends who were around back then are saying that if we look at that, that means this could change a lot too. The difference was that one was never intended to be compatible with anything else. It was a fresh version of D&D. So they could try all these radical different systems and then, and then iterate. This one they specifically said is intended to be compatible they said it we saw it in their initial videos we're seeing it Crawford bringing it up now we see it in the playtest docs they're talking about the compatibility so I think the kinds of things we're seeing changing are, are are iterations and and I don't expect I could be wrong you can point back and be like Mike you are wrong and I'm leaving myself room to be wrong that I don't think we're going to see such significant changes in the future that it is going to break compatibility any more than the kind of stuff we're seeing now. Because this sort of nitpicky class stuff is really where compatibility breaks down. Because Monsters from Monsters of the Multiverse, which is like eight years older than the monsters in the, in, or seven or so years, older than the monsters in the original Monster Manual, they can still play side by side, even though one is a very different take on, than the other. So, so we'll see. Doc Schroeder says, will this be similar to 1E and 2E? I don't think so. I think it's more like early 2E and later to we i have a good friend of mine who had a wonderful quote my friend chris chris if you're listening hey hey dude my friend chris had something that he talked about that I, I thought was really funny and he brought up the fact that he was playing a second edition fighter with the original second edition player's handbook and then a friend of his came to the table with a second edition player's handbook but with the complete fighter the second edition complete fighter book 
And he said that the guy that had the complete fighter book had a character that was like two and a half times more effective than his. He was attacking offhand. He was getting bonus action attacks, whatever the equivalent was back then. He was like way, had way more tools. And Chris is like, are we even playing the same game? Like I've got a fighter and you have a fighter, but your fighter is like totally outstripping mine. I wouldn't be surprised if it's a little like that. Especially when you look at this talk about about new melee options, new weapon, new weapon options. I think it is definitely the equivalent of having a a rogue that is vanilla rogue straight out of the player's handbook and having a rogue that has access to all of the subclasses that exist in Xanathars and Tasha's. And then they get things like aim. They get these new abilities. And like you definitely have this discrepancy of characters who have options from later stuff and you have options from newer. Certainly a 2024 fighter, I bet you is going to be significantly different than a 2014 fighter. Could they both play in the same game? Maybe. But it'll be like my friend Chris. We're like, what are you? You're, you're like knocking people down with mace strikes. I don't get to knock someone down with a mace. What is that? Where does that come from? Oh, that's in the 2024 book, right? So I think there's going to be this like loose compatibility. I would say it's... It feels so far like more compatible than third and 3.5 was and probably on the order of compatibility of second edition where later second edition stuff was very different than early first second edition stuff, but you could theoretically still play with it. So I think, I think that that, I think that that's the case. Scipio says, but some of those things are probably very easy to add to the old 2014 version. Maybe, but maybe not easy enough that you can't not own the book, right? The question is, Will a, is a player, I, I probably, this presumes, a player who, the question is like, if somebody brings a 2014 book, do they have to go buy the 2024 book to, to get that stuff? Like aim, you could just tell a player what that means. Oh, as one of your, one of the rogue actions you get is that you can aim, you can not move. And as long as you don't move, you can get advantage on the attack. That's from Tasha's, but you don't have to buy Tasha's for that one thing. I don't know. I, I would think they might be complicated enough that you would end up wanting to buy the book in order to get them. That, that you, 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 somebody's going to have to read it aloud. At, at least any different than if somebody has to buy a book now and they could share it around a table and all that and you could share it in D&D Beyond, which I'm sure they're very happy to do. So I, 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 I don't, I wouldn't go so far as to say like the stuff that they're changing is stuff that's so easy to do that you don't even need to, rem- you could just remember it. I'm, I don't know. I bet you have to get a book. So what else? Lots of stuff that's very interesting in here. You can see how they added stuff to the cleric early in the levels to offset the fact that they don't get a subclass. So for example, they have the new, they channel divinity at first level, divine spark, they can inflict damage or heal with d 8s equal to your proficiency bonus, which is not small. It's 2d8 to start with. And you get, you know, these, these can be returned. Turn undead, there's this weird thing. Turn Undead is obviously not written very well because they have this thing about a new daze, a new daze stuff, but then they talk about what the effects of are to the undead. It's like, why do you have this whole description of what dazed means in this? It reminds me of Charm and how dorked up Charm is. I hope they fix Charm. They haven't talked about it, but Charm needs some work because Charm means different things depending on who's doing it. They're, they already made a thing called dazed and then immediately offset the fact that daze doesn't work, doesn't work the way it works. One of the things I think here, so, so one of the things that a, a bunch of people took note of is in the spells, they've changed some spells around. And one of the spells that they changed was a uh, spiritual weapon spiritual weapon very popular cleric spell and in the old version of spirit weapon it was a bonus action to cast it and it was a bonus action to move it and have it attack and the big change that they've made this time is that it is concentration and that's a big deal because now you can't have a spiritual weapon and spirit guardians up at the same time or any other concentration spell and i i looked at this and i'm like is that really a problem? Like, you know, this is one of those, like, why are we, why are we doing this? Is that such a problem that it's worth us all having to change our brains around to get over the fact that it used to be a non-bonus action. Now it is, you know, we're going to have conversations about this for the next 10 years. So why are they changing? I think one of the reasons they're changing it is that they, they've said in their design descriptions that they want, they don't want like one spell or one ability or one feat to be the way that a character holds up in a game so they don't want the expectation that there is a spiritual weapon tax on clerics that in order for clerics to be able to do the kinds of things they want to do the assumption is that you're using spiritual weapon i think that's why they made a concentration and that's why they added it that divine spark said that they because you now can do damage as part of your core class ability with divine spark that taking something like spiritual weapon and turning into a bonus into a concentration spell f- fixes that kind of thing. Sure, but is it worth it? Like I don't. I, that's where I get to. Like, is it that you know everything you change, you're hurting our brains. You're you're making us have to relearn something that we've known now for ten years. If it's really worth us doing that, 
that's great. If it's not, are you really want to do it? An example where I think it is worth it is Banish. So Banish has been the bane of many DMs for a long time because with a single bad saving throw, you can remove as big a monster as can fail the save from the battle for as long as the caster doesn't get concentration broken. They have now added that it lasts one minute, but they get to make saving throws at the end of each of their turn. This brings it in line with a lot of the other spells, the saver suck spells that did the same thing. I'm hoping they do the same thing with like hypnotic pattern and some other spells that were kind of big problems with this where, you know, where characters didn't get that, that kind of effect. So I'm glad to see this. I'm, I'm actually dismayed that there's a spell that's not on this list that is in the cleric list. It's a, it's a cleric spell, and it's one that really bugs me. And maybe it's because, Mike Shea, it's just your problem. No one else cares. But I had it really dork up my games, and that was Heroes Feast. What's my bugaboo with Heroes Feast? My bugaboo with Heroes Feast is that it gives immunity to poison damage and immunity to the poison condition. Immunity is a tremendous power. Instead of 50% less damage, it's infinitely less damage. You are going to, no matter how much damage, I could have a, I could have, you know, Poisano, the poison demon prince of poison, who inflicts a million points of poison damage on you, and it's zero. It, it takes it and it just turns it into zero. This is a problem because there are monsters whose entire challenge rating is built around poison damage. And if the characters learn that they're going to be facing one of these, they will take the challenge of that monster. And instead of reducing it, they reduce it almost to zero. And the example is an ancient green dragon. An ancient green dragon does way less damage if it can't do poison. Many of the drow that were published in Monsters of the Multiverse are almost completely ineffective if their poison damage doesn't do anything. Now, Heroes Feast, the the level up 5e version of Heroes Feast does resistance. And I I swear, sorry, future players or current or future players, but if Wizards of the Coast doesn't change Heroes Feast to make it uh, resistance instead of immunity, I'm going to. I'm going to house rule it. And we're going to say it's resistance. And I tell you what, players are still going to cast it because it's still really good. But immunity is tremendously... Is, is is a huge boon the other thing is it is not dispellable it is not concentration and it's the entire group with a single spell you cast it once it's no magical effect it, it's instantaneous so you can't cast dispel magic because it's not really a magical effect they eat the food they get poison they get poison immunity so even if they're in an anti-magic shell they're still poison resist for that whole day so heroes heroes feast to me is a it's one of those spells that it's like if they have it and they use it everything is could be trivial if they don't use it they could get killed and i think that that's an extreme spell turn it into resistance and it's really good right and that's what level up 5e did i really wish heroes feast was on this list i'm going to mention in my playtest survey i'm going to i'm going to mention like hey i noticed you didn't change heroes feast cuz like uh, and this is where you know i like i don't speak for everybody i'm not speaking for the whole dnd community i speak for myself and my own experiences with this i'm a player of dnd i'm a lover of dnd i love this hobby very much i play it i run it i've run it for many years i've run hundreds and you know thousand games i don't think i've run a thousand games but more than 500 games and i've had heroes feast break encounters i've had it where they were knew they were going to fight an ancient gold or ancient green dragon they did heroes feast they walked in kicked his ass and they were laughing about it the players are laughing about it was it cool i don't think so right because then i was like you know then i had to get all like oh well you're not going to be able to buy bowls all the time because i had one where it's like look we're rich i'm going to buy a ton of these bowls we're casting this every day we're going to make sure poison never a factor you want tea, drow green dragons anything with poison which is a good number of monsters we don't have to worry about those guys anymore is that really fun I don't think so. Is it easy for a DM to work with? Not really. So that to me, way bigger issue than spiritual weapon. Like I never had a problem with spiritual weapon. I've never in all of my games did I ever say, oh God, spiritual weapon again. I've said it with a lot of spells, conjure woodland beings, lots of problems, but man, no, I really wish Heroes Feast was on the list. And it's kind of interesting that some spells are on it that I look at and go, I, you know, really? I didn't have a problem with that. And then some like Banish, good work. Right, good work on Banish. Banish needed help. And I hope other spells that are similar to that likewise get help. But Banish has been a problem for a lot of people. A lot of people talked about Banish. Another spell I hope they look at is Tiny Hut. I was just reading a big thread on Reddit about Tiny Hut and how it can like break games. And oh yeah, sure. Are there ways you can deal with it? Absolutely. And I'm sure I'm gonna get a hundred comments from people that are like, oh, here's how you deal with Heroes Feast. Blah 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 blah. It was my it was a pain in my ass. If it's a pain in my ass, it's a pain in my ass. Right? If it's this is we we don't we don't have to agree. If it, if you're cool with it, no problem, right? I'm not, and that's cool. Are there ways to deal with Tiny Hut? Absolutely. 
I've dealt with Tiny Hut. I think I had questions for what do you do about Tiny Hut in a dungeon? And I was like, you fill it with crawling claws. So as soon as the hut goes on, they get covered in crawling claws. It's really fun. But you can only do that like once or twice, right? And then the, the constant Tiny Hut issue or using it like a bunker, you know, that that's a problem. So what do you, I don't know. I hope they do something with Tiny Hut. I don't know what they're going to do. But I know Tiny Hut is an issue because I see it come up a lot. A lot of people bring it up. Heroes Feast, I might be the only person in the world that cares because I don't really see a lot of people like, oh, Heroes Feast completely broke my game. But I, I just think immunity is a real problem. And giving a spell, even a six level spell with a high casting, a high, a high component cost, even in that regard, I had a player who had enough money that he's like, I'm just going to do it all the time. I'm casting it every day. Just can you assume that I'm going to use my six level spell to cast Heroes Feast? Why? Because you get a bunch of hit points, you get all these resistance and immunity to poison. And we never know if we're going to face poison. It's going to be great. Right? As soon as a player says, I'm going to just eliminate a spell slot and use that all the time, that's the time that's going to be a problem. I'll tell you another spell to watch Shield. If you are nerfing spiritual weapon by making a concentration and you don't touch Shield, we got a problem. Because Shield is OP. Oh, OP. I have definitely seen players who dip into wizard just to get shield. I've seen character classes that are built around shield as their primary defenses. Shield. Shield is broken. I don't know. Broken. Like the game has survived. We've been playing. I don't really care. So can I play with shield as is? Absolutely. But it's a, you know, it's way worse than some of the spells that they're changing. So we'll see. We'll see if shield, how shield changes in, in future, in future iterations. I can see shield working on the next hit. But the idea that gives you plus five to your armor class for an entire round. Too much. So the influence action change. There's a new version of that. I think this is one of those Wizards of the Coast is testing something. They talked about this. They said that we're doing like a, almost the equivalent of A-B testing. Where in one play test, they put something in there. They see what results they get back. And then they put a new one and a different one. And they look at the results again. In the original, the one from last time, they had the influence action. And had this very regimented, like here's the reactions that characters are going to do. That NPCs will do depending on the interaction. They've dialed that back in this one and said like there's different attitudes there's different things you could do the only difference is they stuck this like setting the dc the minimum dc for the check is 15 or the creature's intelligence score kind of interesting they're using intelligence score as though it's like a dc that's that's kind of interesting and then outcome if your check succeeds the creature does as asked if you're you know but they they, they definitely pulled back on some of the mechanic -y kind of bits of this i still go with the when i read this it's like well it's better but it feels like even better to me is just teaching DMs how to do role playing. That instead of putting these regimented kind of process in place, sticking this in the Dungeon Master's Guide as a potential system, but then helping DMs understand how the whole NPC interaction thing works out is far better. To me, a far better way of handling this is the DM should think about how the character is going to react and apply a, a difficulty check based on what kind of reaction, the circumstances that are going on, and then roll with it. Like, it's a lot of words here. It's a page worth of material that I think would be far better as guidance to a dungeon master on how to deal with situations like this instead of a, a system. And I wonder, like, is this a philosophical difference in how the new version of D&D is going. I know that Crawford talked a lot about the idea of mother may I problems, that there were some abilities that character classes got that depending on how your DM used it, changed what its effectiveness was in the game. They talked about the use an object. I never really understood this, but I guess the use an object one was an example. So I wonder if this is that idea that like different DMs role play differently. So we want to give this a system that the player can hang on to. But I, I still feel like it, it's, it's handcuffing DMs that, that we have this ability. I had a friend of mine who said, you know, does this change every interaction that already exists in every published adventure where it had a DC for, oh, if you want to convince this guy to do something, you need to do a DC 12. Is this saying like, no, you don't do that anymore. Now you do this. I don't really think so. But it just feels too regimented to me. It feels too, ref even still, like it's better. This is definitely better than what was in the last one. But it still feels like, why don't you just tell me right like teach me teach me as a dm how to handle this kind of thing and then let the fluidity of the difficulty scale work in my favor let me pick a dc between like 10 and 25 or whatever it is whatever you know give different options so i i, I don't i still feel like this and this is kind of like what's in the Dungeon Master's Guide, which is cool, but it's in the Dungeon Master's Guide, not the Player's Handbook. The minute you hand something like this to a player, the player's going to be like, well, it says right here that I get to tell him what to do. And you're like, he doesn't agree. Like, you know, and then you get this, and then you have to go, well, it says that, you know, the DM still gets to decide and it's not mind control. You know, now you're in an argument. I'm not a big fan. I'm still not a big fan. But it is different than it was. So lots of interesting things. 26-page PDF. I, they say the next one is going to be a big, a big chonker. 
So we're going to see more play tests as we go. Definitely, obviously worth reading. You'll find a link in the show notes below to, to, to see the whole thing. And I'll probably be talking about it in the, in the future. I'm, I'm one of the things I do is I, I read it. Sure. But I also try to see like, well, what do other people think? What does the community think of this? What are the issues that are coming up? What is the Reddit has a whole one D and D Reddit subreddit. It's kind of interesting to go dive in there. I don't take it all as gospel. Lots of people have lots of weird opinions, but I go in there and I take a look at like, what are the common things? What are, what are some things we're seeing? Cause every so often there's a line in here and I'll miss it because I'm not a very detail oriented guy. So Somebody else would read that line and was like, oh, that's a big deal. The example was mentioning how to use subclasses from older material. I didn't even really read that in the first one or the second one, but I read it now and now it, it, it changed it changed how how it works. So, you know, I think that I think that there's lots of lots of things to dig into in this, and I think we'll be talking about it more in the future. Today we're gonna do a spotlight of the Tome of Beasts 3 by Kobold Press. I do need to make a disclaimer that I have a monster in Toma Beast 3, and I love Kobold Press. I did pay for my own copy. I, I got my copy through the Kickstarter. I backed the Kickstarter. I got a physical version of the book. I've got it literally sitting right here. And but I did I did get compensation for the monster that I put in the book. So keep that in mind that you know I'm definitely a fanboy and definitely influenced by it. That said. I don't think that I would be so influenced by the fact that I wrote a monster that I would be I would make this statement if it, if I didn't feel it were true. I think this book might be one of the best, if not the best book of monsters that I have seen. It is one of the first books that I have seen that really embraces the design, the new design of monsters that came out with Monsters of the Multiverse and that Wizards of the Coast had leaned towards probably like last year. They definitely kept that design in mind for the monsters that are in here. And I think this book does a better job of running those kinds of monsters and those kinds of stat blocks than I think Monsters of the Multiverse does. I think that there's a level of consistency in the monsters in Toma Beast 3 that I find higher. Now, I could take that back. There are probably, there's some monsters I could look and go, ah, that totally doesn't work. I'll tell you, I've run now a bunch of the monsters in my game and I like them very much. One of the things I like about the monsters in, in, in Toma Beast 3 is that they, they hit really hard. And we're going to talk all about some of the monsters that, that hit really hard. There are 406 monsters across a, the more than 400 page book in Tome of Beasts, in Tome of Beasts 3. This is the fourth book of monsters that Cobalt Press has put out. Tome of Beasts 1 and 2 and the Creature Codex are the three others and then Tome of Beasts 3. And it, when you get to, one, a minor complaint that I will have is when you get to your fourth book of monsters, it gets to the point where a lot of the monsters are pretty strange. You're not really talking about your baseline, straightforward monsters. There's definitely some in here that I think are very universal, but there's also a lot of very specialized monsters that you might use once under a specific circumstance and then never, never come to again, which is kind of a bummer because you sort of want to take the design ethos that exists in the later book and apply it to your former book because you, you want to be able to use some of those design ideas. I actually had a chance to play out a few of these monsters. There's so many that I'm not going to be able to go into all of the monsters that are there, but I am going to, I am going to pick a few that I, that I know something about. So one of them is the black, black shuck was one that I just ran. My characters in my empire, of the ghouls game went to the shadow realm. So I used a lot of monsters that are like shadow realm, shadow realm style. And I really like this dude. This, this, the, the black shuck is a large fiend, a single eyed wolf. I think this comes out of like European mythology and it's almost like a great big werewolf. It's CR 11, so its challenge rating is really, really high. I ran it against characters that I think are like fifth level, so they were definitely over overdone. But boy, they got some really good licks in early on, and it wasn't until later that I got to see it. But you can see that like the stat block itself is pretty pretty small for a CR 11 monster, but it has a lot going on. Three bite attacks and use Curse of the Grave or Fearsome Howl. So the bite is a... 23 point bite attack so it's doing what 13 uh, 23 times three it's a 69 points of damage which is almost exact 77 would be the, the sly flourish baseline but when you include curse of the grave which prevents healing and you include fearsome howl which frightens you're definitely getting some good effectiveness and that's the one thing that i noticed about most of the monsters that i that i looked at is that the damage that they do hits their mark. And this is my complaint about a lot of monsters that come out of Wizards of the Coast is I think they're overweighting 
other abilities that when you include something like the the mist stalker that in dim light the black shot can take the hide action and it's got this like crazy high stealth plus 11 stealth that means it's getting to attack a lot blood frenzy the shock has the black shock has advantage on attack rolls against a creature any creature that doesn't have its hp so it has all of these other things that also boost up its defensive capabilities I think that if you were to go through with the strict Wizards of the Coast, certainly the way Wizards of the Coast has been designing monsters, they would be reducing its damage to make up for these other offensive capabilities. But I say that a challenge rating 11 monster needs those things to be effective anyway, and that that shouldn't count against the monster's damage, that a monster's true effectiveness in combat is the amount of damage it does. It, there are certain abilities that monsters get, Banshees with their scream and everything like that, that are as effective as, as that. A lot of times when you add these special abilities, its offensive CR would be going up, and the way to keep that back down again so you can get it to a CR 11, it's not like a CR 17, is to reduce damage, and a lot of times they do reduce damage. And then, then what happens is you put the monster out there, it's CR 11, but it's not really doing anything. It's doing a bunch of weird stuff but it doesn't actually do any damage. So the, the thing I notice about the Tome of Beast 3, and this is true about Tome of, about Cobalt Press monsters in general, is they hit really hard. It's Cobalt Press monsters are, pound for pound, far more dangerous at their challenge rating than the ones that Wizards of the Coast is publishing. I argue they are at the right challenge rating. I argue that they are doing the kind of damage I would expect a monster of that challenge rating to do. So when I run a Cobalt Press monster, I know that that's going to be an effective monster. I usually don't have to do a bunch of monkeying around and make it more effective. In the case of the Black Shuck, I had to reduce it. I had to do fewer attacks because it was attacking fifth level characters. I, I, I turned the dial the other way. I had to do fewer attacks. I, I didn't use like the Blood Frenzy. I had it use its like dance around mostly defensively. And it was really hard still. They, they were still challenged by it. But, you know, I, I, I might have TPK'd them. I certainly would have dropped a lot of characters doing 69 points of damage per turn per round with the black shock so that is a you know that was one example so here's the monster that i submitted to it and i was really really happy to see this guy the black sun ogre and my idea about this was what if you took an ogre and instead of them being these like wild berserker things like what if these were the ones who managed to kind of hold their mental faculties together they didn't go berserk they actually were pretty smart and they they were still really brutal and you then infused them with infernal energy and made them again essentially like ogre anti-paladins so i wanted like what about what if you had the knights of the round table but they're evil ogres what would that be like and that's that kind of came up with the knights of the black sun they're pretty high too cr8 they make two great sword attacks each one does 19 plus 7 necrotic damage so that's 26 points of 26, 52, so 52 at CR8, 52 divided by 8, they do 6.5, slightly less than your, their, oh, but then they also do the gauntleted backhand, uh, when a creature within 5 feet misses the ogre, it can bop you in the face and knock you prone, and then you get your, your, your thing on there, but uh, then a dark word, it can speak an infernal word to two creatures, Within 120 feet, each target must succeed on a DC 16 con save. So it has a nice range attack too, 44 point range attack that it can do to different ones. It's covered in infernal runes, which up its armor, its armor class. I wanted it to be very straightforward. And my idea behind this monster was that you could use them in pairs. They're designed to travel in pairs. That there's, you know, that they, they go on quests. That dark priests and priestesses will send them on unholy quests. And they'll go off in pairs to go do these unholy quests. So that way in battle, it makes sense that you're fighting two of them. But then also sometimes they are put together as in, in a war and you might have a bunch of these in a war. And boy, if you have to face a bunch of black sun ogres, you're going to be in trouble because they hit hard. So I wanted the I wanted the design to be to be solid enough that you could run them as just a couple of them, but also simple enough that you could run a bunch of these if you wanted 20th level characters. You want to throw a whole bunch of these at 20th level characters, you know bang you can you can you can throw these guys at it so that's that was the the black sun ogre i love these angels they have here they have they have these like almost like the biblical angels the ones that all have like weird shapes weird geometric shapes like look at that one the, the haladron right very cool one little complaint I, it always bugs me when the stat block overlaps two pages maybe in the book they they're still on the same one but a lot of times you have to like flip back and forth between two different pages to see a full stat block that's the problem when you're packing 400 monsters in the 400 pages is definitely going to wrap so it's like do you want more monsters or do you want fewer monsters but they fit nicer on a page that's that's always a big question arcane scavenger goes along with the monster that i put in the other book Tome of beast 2 dreadwalker excavators were a monster that i had in there and they have these arcane scavengers that go along with them it's kind of fun i wonder who did that one 
You can see that a lot of these, like here's an armored ostrich creature. You can see a lot of these is like, that's kind of neat, I guess. It's kind of fun, but boy, like we're getting a lot of weird different kinds of monsters. And, you know, I don't know how how practical a lot of these monsters are. Some like the Baleful Miasma is kind of neat. This is like, I think this is an air elemental that got trapped. It's like an undead air elemental. It's still elemental. But I think that's it's kind of neat. This sort of like remnant, this weird evil remnant of an air elemental that got that got sort of isolated. Pretty cool, pretty cool stuff there. I used this guy as an NPC. I didn't actually use any of his abilities, but I had him. I like the idea of a, a big head, small body dude who hangs out in and manages a bathhouse. In this case, it was a bunch of hot springs with a fey witch. Beach weird. Bergamon seal. Here's a seal that like bursts open and has tentacles coming out of it. I'm not sure when exactly I'd need that. But it looks terrible. This is a good one if you ever want to do a reimagining of the thing. Pretty sure my, my wife's never let me use that monster. So I use Cloudhoof Assassins in my game too. These are CR1 like evil pain in the ass goats that will knock your ass off of stuff. They have like three different ways to knock you off a cliff. And I brought these guys out when the characters were going on a cliffside thing along in the in the Shadow Realm. They dealt with this like weird ooze thing, another monster from Tome of Beast 3 that they were dealing with. And then they were like flying around and then they ran into these guys. And I like these like carnivorous cloud hoofs where we're like, are they really assassins or are they just just jerks like it's not like a cloud hoof assassin sneaks into a king's chamber and poisons their wine it's like no they're just bastards right they'll just headbutt your ass off of a thing and kill you but i still like them and my, my group had a good time with them here's a crab samurai with actual samurai swords pretty funny practical i don't know did i ever say like oh thank god we finally now have the crab samurai i don't think i said that the vitella is a a almost a, an undead demon like a demon mummy I really dig this monster, and I'm actually going to use it in a future Empire of the Ghouls game. So here we have, like, the Rakshasa Maharaja, Fiend Lord Abadandalaya. I'm not going to pronounce that name. Great artwork. Let's take a look at its stat blocks. So this is a CR 22. I'm always big in, like, looking at the big CR stat blocks. 229 hit points, a little low for a CR 22. I go with, like, 15 to 20 hit points per challenge rating. Probably has a lot of defensive stuff, though. Legendary resistance, lim limited magic immunity. Cannot be affected or detected by spells of 8th level or lower. It's going to hurt for your group that likes to cast spells. Six claw attacks or three serpent bow attacks and replace one attack with use of spell casting. If it hits the, a creature with two serpent bow attacks, a swarm of snakes appears and the target's acting as an ally of the Majorai obeying its telepathic commands remains for a minute. Or two dismisses, dismisses a bonus action. No more than four swarms, so he can swarm you with stuff. His claw does 17 points. And how many does he get? Six. So let's look at that. Six times 17. That's 102. And then he can do three serpent bow attacks as legendary actions. And those are 26 plus 102. That's 180 damage or eight damage per challenge rating. That's effective. That's not even including his spells that he can do. It's not including his duplicitous disguise, sacrificial monkey when it makes a melee attack, a, a withered monkey compo composed of shadow appears and throws itself into the path of the attack, having the damage. And you can do that as a reaction. That's nasty. So he has lots of other capabilities, but his damage output is eight damage per challenge rating, which is really good. 10 damage per challenge rating is my CR 20 and above where I think it should be. Eight is still much better. A lot of times it's like three and four. It's really low. So very effective monster. This one looks like it would be a lot of fun and fits on an entire, the stat block fits on an entire page. That's really cool. If you can't tell, I highly recommend the Toma Beast 3. I think the monster design in here is excellent. This is really shows what like eight years of monster design looks like, the, the knowledge of monster design looks like. Really cool monsters, really effective. I've been using in my game. I cannot wait to use them in, in future games that I've been running. So I would definitely pick up the Toma Beast 3 by Cobalt Press. I want to quickly mention that Cobalt Press also currently has the the adventure the adventure catalog they have current deals that are going on the deals are changing i think it's every weekday and they have, sometimes have freebie stuff so you want to check this out there is a link to the adventure calendar in the show notes below check it out poke at it every day you can, you can for example you can get the margrieve players guide for 50 percent off on the soft cover three dollars off the pdf some pretty good deals but also sometimes they're offering some free stuff i went and grabbed a free preview that they are free product that they had put out the first day so definitely check that out every month i put up a patreon q a on the sly flourish patreon server 
people patrons can ask any question they want as, as it relates to D&D and some of the I answer every one of them on the Patreon but some of them I bring here to the show so that we can talk about them here on the show other ones sometimes become the catalyst for an article or a full video Bastian L says I know you like to get inspiration from other systems I've been reading Doctor Who RPG books a lot of interesting ideas for our games and I recommend one thing I like a lot is the way they propose to organize combat the idea is to ask the character if they want to one talk two move three do or four fight each round you can do only you can you can uh, only choose one each round you can only choose one and they go in that order so trying to avoid combat by talking first then the movers then the doers finally fighters it's the doctor who's doctor who's spirit but i would wanted to know if you could apply in a 5e game at least to encourage non-combat outcomes and to avoid the fact that once the pc attacks the only way forward is to fight thoughts yeah, it's very interesting. I haven't read it, so I don't. I'm, this is the first time that I've heard of this idea and this rule. The thing that kind of gets me is: can you? Do you need a system for this, or can you let the circumstances of the situation? Can the DM manage the circumstances of the situation so that these are options? I, I've definitely both groups that I run with regularly, many groups that I've run over the years have. I've often tried to start with: can we talk to it? Can we get around it or do we have to fight it? The idea that you can do that every round and you can sort of stop a fight makes sense. And that 5e, it definitely like once you started a fight, it's hard to stop. But even that, I don't think that's the mechanics that get in the way. I think it's the story. If you start attacking and killing people, it's not likely you're going to convince the other people to be your friends. Right? Once combat has started, once you've caused wounds, I think that that makes it difficult. I do think it's something that a DM can be paying attention to and ask like, you know, do you want to talk this through? That'll, and this is where like, pause for a minute are you guys sure that you want to engage in combat with this? Or do you want to try to continue your conversation? Like if somebody says, I shoot it with a bow, do you say, okay, before you're able to shoot the bow, let's pause for a minute. Is everybody good with shooting the bow? Or are you going to convince them not to shoot the bow? Now the DM might also get in a circumstance where somebody's like, oh, I really want to talk to the bullet. I'm sure it's just misunderstood. And like the bullet's trying to bite your face off. Like I know, but maybe we can just do an animal handling check and it'll be fine. Like, no, the bullet's going to eat your face. So the DM also knows the circumstances in ways that the players might not and say, no, you don't think that there's any way to deal with this other than combat. It's definitely physically attacking you. So the DM can kind of control that pacing and kind of kind of manage things to say, like if there was a chance for talking, and it's clear some of the players were interested in that, but the other ones weren't, then yeah, you can shift it over and say, hey, talk, talkers, you guys have your opportunity to talk before these guys get an opportunity to attack. Because once they attack, it, it, you can't really go the other way. But I don't know that you need to wire a system around it. I think like for Doctor Who, it might work perfectly. I don't know that I would take that as a mechanical concept and bring it into my game. Instead, I would take the philosophical idea and see if you could bring it into your game. That idea of can you give opportunities to the talkers to talk their way out when it makes sense? Or, you know, or, or is it really just time for a fight? And are there good, graceful ways to get out of the fight? Maybe the people that got killed, the other people didn't care about. Or they're like, oh, those were a bunch of jerks, but we're not jerks. This is what happened in my Scarlet Citadel game. So I think there's ways to deal with that. Renan R says, I'm narrating Tolis for my friends, and I've encountered some difficulties which have nothing to do with the setting or adventure. I'm finding the pacing of my game to be very slow, and I would like to speed it up a little bit. We only play online. My players like to spend time exploring. They like to see the dungeon map open to open all the doors, see every corner. I've tried using Theater of the Mind, but they don't like it. They prefer the map and have fun with it. Is there a way to strike a balance between exploring and speeding up the game without feeling intrusive? So yes, one, and it's important to ask, is everybody having a good time? You might not be because you are like this, I'm bored, right? You as the DM, you're bored. But there's also the question of are all of the other players on board or is it really like three of your five players love exploring everything and the other two are, are surfing other websites? That, that's a question to ask and, and to try to dig into and figure out if that's, if that's the case. If all five really are enjoying the way you're doing it, and you're okay with it. I don't see that there's a problem. But the other thing is a, a, a way to handle this. There's a, a couple of tools. And by tool, I mean just ideas that you can keep in your head. One is you can let them know when they've thoroughly explored everything. So you can smash cut and say like you explore the remaining three rooms and find nothing of interest or you explore the remaining three rooms and these are the things you find that are of interest. You can sort of skip them moving around, checking all that stuff and just jump to what's the conclusion if they thoroughly explored an area, you can say, you feel like you've thoroughly explored this area. There's nothing more to find here. And just say that to them. Just tell them that. And that way they go, well, what about that bookcase? N really, there's nothing else. There's a bunch of moldery books. But there's nothing else. To, there's, you, you're, you're, you, have, you feel like you've discovered everything that's of any potential worth or value in this. And skip, skip ahead that way. So that's one. Just telling the players that they've seen everything they're going to see is a way to kind of move things forward. The other one is to have circumstances in the game that make them move a little bit 
bit faster. If they explore every single room, the ritual is going to complete and they're going to be summoning a monster far worse than what they would face if they got there on time. And make sure they know that this is the case. Give them time constraints in the scenario to know that they can't just wander around. Now, sometimes it might not make sense. And if it doesn't, then you're going to have to expect that they are going to take a lot of time. But, you know, if you if if you can find ways and I would always recommend to write down 10 ways, think of 10 ways in your game that you can put something in place that the characters have to move forward faster than if they're exploring every single corner of a room. I think that that is one way to do it. They have to complete the ritual. They have to get back to town before another event occurs. Another group is coming by. Guards are going to come. You know, People are going to be more alerted to the fact that you're there. Other monsters are going to show up. The earth is going to collapse. What are, what are different ways that you can have to sort of scale up the speed to make sure that the players are moved ahead? So those are, those are kind of three things I would recommend. Talk to the players and see how much they're enjoying it gauge your own enjoyment see what needs to actually be fixed Two, use use just talk to them about the fact that they've explored everything jump cut to say you explore the rest of the dungeon you find the following treasure in a few different treasure boxes or whatever or you have thoroughly explored this area and there's nothing else to find here to kind of skip you know searching every single corner and three put in put in situations that require timely action to get them to move forward instead of exploring and that is a dial you have to turn how much pressure do you put on them to move forward how much do you let them explore with the recognition that if you turn the dial in the direction of not exploring that they might they might take their time so Renan, i hope that answers your my friends we have come to the end of the lazy dd talk show i want to thank all of you for hanging out with me today i hope you enjoyed today's show if you like this show and you like the work that i do i suggest subscribing to the sly flourish newsletter you get a weekly newsletter sent directly to your inbox with DD tips and links to all of the other things that i do and a free adventure generator pdf it's completely free to sign up you can also support me directly on patreon patrons of sly flourish get access to all kinds of exclusive tips tricks maps adventures city source books all kinds of stuff that they get for being a patrons of sly flourish but most of all you help me put on shows like this so thank you to the patrons of sly flourish and you can pick up any of my books at the sly flourish bookstore all of the links for those are in the show notes below thank you all very much have a great day and get out there and play some DD.